Hi friends, welcome back to More Than Words. Today we're going to be reading the first story in James Harriet's Treasury for Children. Illustrations by Ruth Brown and Peter Barrett. Moses the Kitten, illustrated by Peter Barrett. There have been times in the winter when I have regretted being a vet, and this looked like one of them. I had driven about 10 miles from home, thinking all the time that the dales always looked their coldest. Not when they were covered with snow, but as now when the first sprinkling shrieked the bare flanks of the fells and bars of black and white, like the ribs of a crouching beast. And now in front of me was a farm gate rattling on its hinges as the wind shook it. The car, heaterless and droughty as it was, seemed like a haven in the uncharitable world, and I gripped the wheel tightly with my woolen-gloved hands for a few moments before opening the door. The wind almost tore the handle from my fingers as I got out, but I managed to crash the door shut before stumbling over the frozen mud to the gate. Muffled as I was in a heavy coat and scarf pulled up to my ears, I could feel the icy gust biting at my face, whipping up my nose and hammering painfully into the air spaces in my head. I had driven through and streamy-eyed was about to get back into the car when I noticed something unusual. There was a frozen pond just off the path and among the rimmed covered rushes which fringed the dead opacity of the surface, a small object stood out, shiny black. I went over and looked closer. It was a tiny kitten, probably about six weeks old, huddled and immobile, eyes tightly closed. Bending down, I poked gently at the furry body. It must be dead. A morsel like this couldn't possibly survive in such a cold. But no. There was a spark of life because the mouth opened soundlessly for a second, then closed. Quickly, I lifted the little creature and tucked it inside my coat. As I drove into the farmyard, I called to the farmer who was carrying two buckets out of the calf house. I've got one of your kittens here, Mr. Butler. It must have strayed outside. Mr. Butler put down his buckets and looked blank. Kitten? We haven't got no kittens at the present. I showed him my find and he looked more puzzled. Well... That's a rum un. There's no black cats on the spot. We've all sorts of colors, but no black uns. Well, he must have come from somewhere else, I said. Though I can't imagine anything so small traveling very far. It's rather mysterious. I held the kitten out and he engulfed it with his big, work roughened hand. Poor little beggar, he's only just alive. I'll take him into the house and see if the missus can do out for him. In the farm kitchen, Miss Butler was all concern. Oh, what a shame. She smoothed back the bedragged hair with one finger. And it's got such a pretty face. She looked up at me. What is it anyway, a him or her? I took a quick look behind the hen legs. It's a Tom. Right, she said. I'll get some warm milk into him, but first of all, we'll give him the old cure. She went over to the fireside oven on the big black kitchen range, opened the door, and popped him inside. I smiled. It was the classical procedure when newborn lambs were found suffering from cold and exposure. Into the oven they went, and the results were often dramatic. Miss Butler left the door partly open, and I could just see the little black figure inside. He didn't seem to care much what was happening to him. The next hour, I spent in the bry wrestling with the hen feet of a cow. The cleats were overgrown and grossly mishappened, and upturned, causing the animal to hobble along on her heels. My job was to pare and hack away the ex's horn, and my long-held opinion that the hind feet of a cow were never meant to be handled by man was thoroughly confirmed. We had a rope around the hog, and the leg pulled over a beam in the roof of the leg still pissing back and forth while I hung on till my teeth rattled. By the time I had finished, the sweat was running into my eyes, and I had quite forgotten the cold day outside. Still, I thought, as I eased the kinks from my spine when I had finished, there were compensations. There was a satisfaction in the sight of a cow standing comfortably on two almost normal-looking feet. Well, that's something like, Mr. Button grunted. Come in the house and wash your hands. In the kitchen, as I bent over the brown earthenware sink, I kept glancing across the oven. Miss Butler laughed. Oh, he's still with us. Come and have a look. It was difficult to see the kitten in the dark interior, but when I spotted him, I put my hand and touched him, and he turned his head towards me. He's coming around, I said. That hour in there has worked wonders. 
doesn't often fail, the farmer's wife lifted him out. I think he's a little toughen. She began to spoon warm milk into his tiny mouth. I reckon we'll have him lapping in a day or two. You're going to keep him then. Too true we are. I'm going to call him Moses. Moses? Hey, you found him among the rushes, didn't you? I laughed. That's right. It's a good name. I was on the butler farm about a fortnight later and I kept looking around for Moses. Farmers rarely have their cats indoors and I thought that if the black kitten had survived, he would have joined the felon colony around the buildings. Farm cats have a pretty good time. They may not be petted or cosseted, but it has always seemed to me that they lead a free, natural life. They are expected to catch mice, but if they are not so inclined, there is an abundant food at hand. Bowls of milk here and there, and the dog's dishes to be raided if anything interesting is left over. I had seen plenty of cats around today, some fleeting nervously away, others friendly and purring. There was a tabby loping gracefully across the cobbles, and a big turquoise shell was curled in a bed of straw at the warm end of the bribe. Cats are connoisseurs of comfort. When Mr. Butler went to fetch some hot water, I had a quick look in the bullock house, and a white tom regarded me passively from between the bars of a hay rack where he had been taking a siesta. But there was no sign of Moses. I finished drying my arms and was about to make a casual reference to the kitten when Mr. Butler handed me my jacket. Come round here with me if you've got a minute, he said. I've got something to show you. I followed him through the door at the end of a cross of a pathway to the long, low-roofed piggery. He stopped at a pen about halfway down and pointed inside. Look here, he said. I leaned over the wall and my face must have shown my astonishment because the farmer burst into a shout of laughter. That's something new for you, isn't it? I stared unbelievingly down at the large sow stretched comfortably on her side, suckling a litter of twelve piglets, and right in the middle of the long pink row, furry, black, and incongruous, was Moses. He had a teat in his mouth and was absorbing his nourishment with the same rapt enjoyment as his smooth skin fellows on either side. What the? I gasped. Mr. Butler was still laughing. I thought you'd never seen anything like that before. I never have either. But how did it happen? I still couldn't drag my eyes away. It was the missus' idea, he replied. When she got the little youth lap and milk, she took him out to find a right warm spot for him in the buildings. She settled on this pen because the so Bertha had just had a litter and had a heater in it and it was a grand and cozy. I nodded. Sounds just right. Well, she put Moses in a bowl of milk in here, the farmer went on, but the little feller didn't stay by the heater very long. Next time I looked in, he was round at the milk bar. I shrugged my shoulders. They say you see something new every day at this game, but this is something I've never heard of. Anyway, he looks well on it. Does he actually live in the sow's milk, or does he still drink from his own bowl? A bit of both, I reckon. It's hard to say. Anyway, whatever mixture Moses was getting, he grew rapidly into a sleek, handsome animal with an unusually high gloss to his coat, which may or may not have been due to the porcelain element of his diet. I never went to the butler's without having a look in the pig pen. Bertha, his foster mother, seemed to find nothing unusual in this hairy intruder and pushed him around casually with pleased grunts just as she did with the rest of her brood. Moses, for his part, appeared to find the society of the pigs very congenial. When the piglets curled up together and settled down for sleep, Moses would be somewhere in their heap, and when his young colleagues were weaned at eight weeks, he showed his attachment to Bertha by spending most of his time with her. And it stayed that way over the years. Often he would be right inside the pen, rubbing himself happily along the comforting bulk of the sow. But I remember him best in his favorite place, crouching on the wall looking down, perhaps meditatively, on what have been his first warm home. Thank you so much for joining us today, friends. I hope you enjoy the story by James Harriet's Treasury for Children as much as I have. Stay tuned for more great stories. Please make sure to give us a big like and subscribe. Thank you and have a blessed day.